Ladies and gentlemen, this is Captain Ball again with another interesting story from Firearms History for you. The rifle I have here for you is a Wenzel rifle, 1867 model Wenzel rifle from the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. That's quite an interesting rifle and it's an important rifle too, because this was the first generally issued breech loader of the Habsburg army. Well, 1866, the year 1866 was a great defeat. The Prussian-Austrian war showed the tactical and the complete military inferiority of the, of the Habsburg army. In fact, the first step in modernizing the army was converting the Lorenz muzzle loaders to breech loaders. And this was the result. The Prussian army started the full-scale reform process just after signing the humiliating peace treaty of Tilsit in 1807. The basic element of this reform was the improvement of tactics and equipment. In their new system, fighting in open order, paying more attention to accuracy and increasing the rate of fire were critical elements. The new system required a new infantry arm, so they accepted a breech loader for service. The Dreiser needle gun firing a United cartridge multiplied the rate of fire of the contemporary military muzzle loading rifles. The accuracy was nearly the same, but the Prussian infantryman fired two or three times more as a percussion rifle armed foot soldier. Another advantage of the breech loader was that it could be loaded and fired in any position, even while hiding behind cover. The new rifle gave a huge advantage to the defending unit and severely increased the casualty rate of any infantry still using close fighting orders and shock tactics. After the war of 1866 between Austria and Prussia, it was obvious that the old Napoleonic tactics and mass loaders must be eliminated from modern military sciences once and for all. What to do with the old muzzle-loading percussion rifles? That was a great question in the mid-19th century in Europe, when everybody was converting to breech-loading. Well, to keep them in service, they needed a simple solution, and that was a trapdoor design. If you check the Snyder Enfield, the Tabatier system, or the Milbank Amsler system that we used here in the Austro-Hungarian Wenzel rifle, they are pretty much all the same. You cut the breech of the muzzle-loader, put some door on the end, and insert the cartridge from the rear. That was the simplest and probably the cheapest solution. The new breech needed improvement in cartridge design as well. The paper cartridge was not able to properly seal the breech, therefore metallic cases were needed. The Wenzel rifle fired a rimfire 14.33R cartridge. The copper case held 4.4 grams of Gewehrpulver or black powder and a 14.3mm diameter projectile weighing 29.7 grams. These cartridges were not possible to manufacture by hand, therefore this conversion also marks the beginning of the true industrialization of ammo making. The first machines were ordered from the United States, but later many private factories stood up for serving the army of the monarchy. The cartridge cases were quite expensive, therefore the spent cases were officially reloaded by factories or by the units themselves. One case could be used three times for live ammo and three times as blank cartridge. The one in the picture shows a complete life circle for a case, with six hits on the rim. My Wenzel is a center fire version that I'll explain later, so it is a bit easier to reload. As usual, I am replicating a close load of the original and reload my cases manually. I start with repriming the case with standard large pistol primers. When you do this, always wear safety glasses. Then comes charging the case. My powder is 68 grains of Swiss 2F powder that delivers the same 375 meter per sec muzzle velocity as the original cartridge did. My bullet is not the original, unfortunately, but an enlarged Lorenz bullet. However, the weight and the diameter are exactly the same as the original. Converting the Lorenz rifle into a breech-loading Wenzel rifle was not an easy task. Let me show you now the steps of this process. All the parts for the conversion and the Lorenz infantry, Jäger and extra core rifles were provided by the Arsenal in Vienna, but the conversions were done by private contractors in strongly varying quality. The mechanics were quite simple. The breech could be opened while the hammer was in full cock. 
The soldier loaded the cartridge as deep as possible, closed the breech, fired, pulled back the hammer to full cock, opened the breech while the extractor extracted the case and started the process again. The system was much stronger, faster and reliable than the needle fire systems and the copper case expanding into the chamber created a totally gas tight seal. Let me show you how the system works. There are four elements of the system. The breech block, the trap door with the firing pin, the locking bar and the lock of course. So this is the open position of the locking bar. Here you can close and open the breech. If it's in the forward position, the breech is closed, which technically means that the breech is only locked when the gun is fired, just at the same moment. When the hammer falls forward, it locks the breech. Let me show you exactly how this works. There's a little pin on the tumbler, which you can see on the original Lawrence lock, which is the activator of the locking bar. Here is how it works. Now it is in the open position and when we fire the gun and the hammer moves forward it locks the breech. It's now open. It is now locked. During the test shooting day I fired 50 or 60 shots with the rifle without any flaws, without any problems. And there is only one single problem that I, I realized and it's a safety issue. Because to load the gun you have to put the hammer into full cock position. Open the breech, put in the cartridge, close the breech and in this position the gun can fire if you touch the trigger, which is not really safe. So I'm pretty sure that when they were designing the other single shot, the, the new single shot small caliber rifles, it was an important factor to be able to load the gun in the safety position with the safety engaged. So loading the barrel from the breech offered beautiful advantages like the soldier could fire and load the gun in any position and also the rate of fire increased. Let me show you how fast it is to shoot this beauty. Another key element of the Prussian infantry tactics against the Austrians was the Schnell fire or fast firing, meaning that when the enemy closed fighting order marched within 100 meters, all soldiers loaded and fired their guns as fast as possible, creating a continuous wall of fire and smoke, a devastating damage never seen before. With my limited practice I was able to fire 5 shots in 30 seconds, but a well-trained soldier was expected to load and fire the gun 17 to 18 times in 60 seconds, with cartridges given in his hands. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the point in fast firing. I did not really pay attention to aiming. The distance was 100 paces or 75 meters and I was just placing my sight somewhere here and I was just loading and firing. And this is what Schnell fire is about. It does not really matter how good you are in target shooting, the rifle will hit. At this distance, the rifle will do its job. Regarding the firing rate, the Wenzel can be considered a quite modern gun, as it was capable of firing 14 to 17 shots per minute, which was just excellent compared to the muzzle loading rifles. But the ballistics of that bullet did not change at all. It was exactly the same as the bullet fired from the Lawrence rifles. The graphics you see here come from the original new exercise manual of 1867. The shorter curve shows the trajectory of the bullet fired with the basic 300 paces or 225 meter sight setting. Aiming to the middle of the body, this bullet can kill or wound the foot soldier up to 360 paces. The longer curve shows the bullet path if the sights are set to 400 paces and the rifle is aimed at 400 paces. The dashed line between letter D and B shows that in this case the large portion of the battlefield is quite safe for the enemy, as the bullet will fly over the average height of a man. That is the reason why it was important to flatten the trajectory with smaller caliber, lighter bullet and larger muzzle velocity. This coverage problem gets even worse if we increase the distance, when a rifleman armed with a Wenzel rifle was aiming and shooting to 900 paces, only 3.8% of the total range was covered. When we are talking about ballistics, of course we are not talking about the modern flat trajectory bullets, 
this heavy lead stuff that we fire from these guns it's just curved as the trajectory of a mortar so let's see what the rifle really does at different distances i'm going to start at 50 meters because i want to really check that if the old manuals are correct regarding the height of the impact compared to the aiming point so let's start at 50 meters and we'll see what the rifle is capable of and we will move then forward to different distances When you are firing an original military rifle, it is certain that the rifle will shoot high with open sights, as all military rifles are sighted in to hit the upper body while aiming to the belly. It is the same case with the Vancer rifle as well. My next stop will be 75 meters or 100 paces. This is important for me because 100 paces was the point where the Schnell fire or fast firing began. So let's check the 100 paces distance now. According to the original manual, the height of impact compared to the aiming point should be 65.75 centimeters. As at 50 meters, I am aiming to the bottom of the black bull's eye. The second five shots are aimed to the bottom center of the target to replicate the original aiming method of the manual. So ladies and gentlemen, these are two groups at 100 paces or 75 meters. The difference between the two groups is that when I was firing this one, I was aiming on the center bottom of the black area. And when I was shooting the second group, I was aiming, as the manual says, in the, on the middle of the body. So somewhere here. Technically, I was aiming here because this seemed to be like a secure spot for, for setting my sights. Both groups are good. I really have to say that... that uh, from an old lady like this, this is just excellent. 
good for hunting. Probably I will hunt with this rifle as well. So well within 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 let's say 10 centimeters and 10 centimeters maximum 12 centimeters it's good it's perfect for the for the for the contemporary use tactical use it is more than okay i already mentioned to you that my venzer rifle is a center fire piece which is quite unusual well this is not a custom modification but also proof that after 1866 target shooting became more important than ever for the army of the Habsburg monarchy Every single infantry company received four center fire rifles and four indoor shooting sets to be able to train in the barracks as well. The indoor set consisted of a 5.5mm bore and a loading adapter holding a small caliber lead bullet, primer and few grains of black powder or later a little amount of gun cotton. Well my rifle is one of these guns. Fully loaded live ammo was also issued for these guns. Well, I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm really curious what it can do at the end of the tactical range, which is 300 paces or 225 meters. I'm going to fire the gun from the rest, of course, and I only have four cartridges left, so please forgive me that it's not five shots as usual, but only four, but I really hope that we can be on the target. Shooting at 300 paces or 225 meters is quite tricky with open sights, as effects of mirage and wind must be understood well. At 300 paces the human body is still visible but looks awfully small in the sights. I followed the manual and aimed at the center of the bull. If the manual and my cartridges are right, the shot must be in the target. I just love when we can clearly hear the impact of the long flight time bullet on the target. And the last one. Let's check it. Well, 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 ladies and gentlemen, what we have here is a clear evidence that they really knew how to make a rifle and how to make a cartridge. What I was doing here is nothing else what was written in the manuals. I was aiming somewhere here in the center of the bullseye, because that's my only clear spot at 225 meters or 300 paces. And look, out of the four shots, I have one, two, three, very close to the center, just at the level where they have to be. That's a clear proof that my cartridge is also a good reproduction of the original. And I only have one flyer here, but that's, only on the, that's also on the target. So out of the four shots, four on the target, three wounding the soldier and two lethally wounding him. And probably this one could hit somebody in the back rows. So the rifle really did what it was expected to do back in the 19th century and today as well. I love the Wenzel rifle. Back in the 19th century, the theorists really did not care about the proper terminal ballistics. They did not understand the proper ballistics because they did not have the tools to check it. The only tool they had is they placed uh, uh, pine wood planks at different di distances and it was enough to understand how many pine wood planks the bullet can penetrate at different distances and that was all. That was terminal ballistics. Well, we have modern, more modern tools. We have ballistic gelatin, we have high frame rate cameras, so we can really understand more how the bullet is behaving when it hits the body. Now, I already tested the ballistic effect of the of the Lorenz bullet and really I have to say that there's a Lorenz bullet loaded into the cartridge and it is fired with the same velocity as I was testing it so there is no 
need to test it again. The ballistic gelatin tests I did with the Lawrence rifle are still okay, it is still the situation. But I have a new ballistic gelatin block as well, which is in fact not ballistic gelatin, but it's silicon, it's synthetic. It is the same material as what the FBI uses for testing rounds. It is completely transparent, so with a high frame rate camera we will be able to see not just the permanent cavity, but the temporary cavity as well, which tells a lot about how this bullet behaved when it did hit the human body. Let's check that experiment now. When the bullet hits the target, it transfers its kinetic energy to the substance. The larger the energy and faster the transfer is, the more it stretches the tissue to the limits of its elasticity, causing disruptions. This effect is visible as the temporary cavity. If you look close, you can even see the dieseling effect of the gelatin, that is a small explosion of compressed air mixed with small particles of silicon. Ladies and gentlemen, what do you say about the temporary cavity? I was shocked to see it. It was very impressive. Of course, the bullet is not pointed, it is rounded, so this is why the effect is so strong, but it was really nice, it is really nice. Of course, we are talking about uh, damaging a human body and killing somebody, so it is not really, really, really wise to be so happy about it. But from a scientific point of view, this is very interesting, very interesting. My rifle was made as an 1854 Lorenz Jäger Stützen in the factory of Ferdinand Frühwirth in Vienna in 1860. It bears the official military inspection marks of the arsenal. According to the unit markings, this particular piece was issued to the 7th Feldjäger Battalion. This battalion fought on the Italian theater of war in 1866. The rifle was converted to breech loader in 1867 by Louise Benz. And it was issued to the 9th Landwehr Supplying Depot, so technically it was placed in the reserves as by this time the small caliber Vander rifle was already in production. The rifle is in completely shootable condition with a perfect min bore that is very important for historical shooting sessions like this. The curved sight or Bogen Vizier is a modernized version of the original Lorenz sight. It can be precisely set to maximum 1200 paces or 900 meters. Modernizing the rifle was an important step, but not enough to be competitive against the Prussians. It needed more and deeper reforms as well. Let me talk a bit about what kind of reforms they implemented in the infantry in 66-67. As part of the reforms, the Habsburg army finally pensioned the white Waffenrock, that proved to be a beautiful target for rifled arms. The new uniform was blue, a color considered a good camouflage color in the 19th century. A new cartridge box was also issued, based on the Prussian design. It was attached to the waist belt in front of the belly to ease cartridge access. The basic tactical unit became the company, and while the diploid line and the column still remained in use, the most important tactical formation became the Prussian style Schwarmlinie, built from the skirmish line, the support troops, and the reserve. The infantry was supposed to break the enemy with rifle fire from that point, and the charge of the bayonet became only the very last element of the show. So the Wenzel rifle became obsolete immediately when it entered service because of the curved trajectory, but it played an important part in the history of the K and K army, as this was the very first general issue breech loading firearm of the infantry, and it fired a metallic cartridge, which was quite good by those times. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been watching the Cap Angle YouTube channel. If you like what I do, then please subscribe. If you wish to support me, and you can support me, you can do it through Patreon. You can find the link under this video, and also you can support me by buying my percussion revolver cartridge boxes and cartridge formers. You can find the link for the eBay store also under this video. So what more can I say? Until next time, stay cool and keep your powder dry.